Thank you, Brother Snyder. Take your Bibles, turn back to the book of Genesis. I was going to try to have you out by the Bears game today, but Brother Colson took forever, and uh, you can blame him. Make sure you come back tonight, 30,000 pieces of candy. Uh, it'll be fun at your house tonight. Your kids will be wired, but uh, better your house than mine. What a great story for the Colson read for us. What an amazing story. Here a man would take his only son, and a young man that we would call a young man, or I would at least, because I think he would, would have been in his 30s. Some believe younger, some believe just a tad bit older, doesn't matter. Obviously, uh, uh, when, when he, Abraham was taking Isaac to this mountain to offer him as a sacrifice, this boy had enough strength and enough youth and enough zeal to have easily gotten away from an old man. The story of the father wanting to sacrifice his son to please the Lord is an interesting one at best, but it's, it's still, you know, it doesn't advocate, and God wasn't trying to teach us that to, to advocate child sacrifice, or God wasn't a, a cruel God any, by any stretch, you know, why would God ask this of a man? And uh, first of all, God gives life. God can take life whenever he wants to. But more importantly than that, you look at the story, I believe, of the sacrifice itself could have gotten up and walked away at any time. He could have taken on his father and said, you know, you're not binding my hands, you're not binding my feet, you're not putting me on this altar, I'm not carrying this wood up, I know what you're up to, and, uh, you know, I can take you, I can run from you, I can hurt you, whatever, but I don't have to lay down my life here and die, I don't have to offer this myself. Abraham didn't really offer his son, his son offered himself. A tremendous trust factor there, an incredible trust factor. Last week, we spoke about faith. Today, I want to speak on the subject of where, where's the trust? Trust. See, what's the difference between faith and trust? Well, faith is a noun. It's something that you have. Trust is a verb. It is something that you do. Faith is knowing that, you know what, I'll trust my, I mean, my father has a plan. I know, you know, whatever is going on here is of the Lord. Trust is literally laying down his life on that altar and letting his father take the knife and put it over his chest and begin the swing, on, uh, the swing down. That's trust. One of the greatest misuses of power in the world is destroying the trust in people. One of the greatest heartbreaks of a leader is when trust from a follower is, is misused or there is distrust in a follower. When a parent loses the trust of a child because of the actions of that child, that's a tremendous heartbreak to a mom and dad because every mom and dad wants to develop a trust in that child. But they stay out late, they break the rules, they wreck the car, they lie. They have broken that trust with mom or dad. That hurts parents deeply. When a wife has broken the trust in her husband by, the, by, by, by an adulterous relationship or vice versa, the husband breaking the trust of a wife, those are very disheartening things and very difficult parts of life when that trust has been broken. When a parent destroys the trust in their children by, by breaking promises or by by breaking the bond of matrimony and destroying the family, family unity. Those things are very, very difficult to deal with. A public leader destroys the trust of their followers. It's very difficult for those followers to once again put their faith and trust in another leader of any kind, whether it be a church pastor, whether it be a politician, whether it be a president, whether it be a civic leader of, of any kind, a school principal, when that trust has been broken and has been misused, it is very difficult for those who follow to find their way again. Destroyed trust in Proverbs chapter 25 verse 19 says confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. It's very painful. It's very difficult to live with. Brother, you saw Brother Moore over here with, with a cast on his foot. He got, he got preaching pretty hard I guess in Ghana and stomped his foot is why you take it right. 
and, uh, or he kicks somebody. He's sticking with the stomping of his foot and uh, story, but he broke his foot. And it's been very painful. It's not been healing well. And uh, it's made his life incredibly difficult and, and, and hard to handle at times and having to sit for long periods of time with his foot elevated with ice on it and wondering when it's going to heal and how it's going to heal and those things. And, and Proverbs teaches us that, that the broken promises or lack of confidence in somebody is, is like a broken foot. It's very discomforting. It's, it's, it's difficult to deal with, but it is manageable. When trust is, this kind of trust happens, you have this uh, dissension, you have division, you have broken relationships, you have failed businesses, you have church splits, you have generation gaps. That's the 70s term, once again, I'm reverting back to my old days. But generation gaps between young people and adults because of, of distrust or broken promises. You have economic failure that will happen if there's distrust in a local economy or a national economy. Great thing, terrible things happen when people begin to distrust one another. When there is great trust, you have wonderful relationships. You have marriages that last 50 plus years. You have businesses that expand. You have institutions that grow. You have children who become faithful and fulfilled adults. You have a church that becomes a family. And you have people whose needs are met in great ways when there is great trust. But trust is an awesome thing, though it is a very fragile thing. There are times in our life when we, we, we don't understand the difference between faith and trust sometimes. I read this story, I think his name is Benini, that, uh, Beni, Beniti, Beniti, that uh, was one of, the, one of these uh, tightrope walkers that walked across Niagara Falls back many, many years ago. And uh, he was telling the story as he would walk across Niagara Falls and the crowd just loved him and he became quite quite efficient at it, and then took a wheelbarrow across, and, and everybody was just amazed. And when he got the other side, he started to speak to the crowd, and they were cheering, and, they, and he said, you believe that I can, I can walk across Niagara Falls again with this wheelbarrow? And they said, yes, we do. He said, how many of you would volunteer to ride in the, in the wheelbarrow? That's the difference between faith and trust. I believe you can do it, but I'm not getting in the wheelbarrow. I believe you can take it across, but maybe not with me. When marriages have been, have been slighted by infidelity and, and distrust, they can be healed, but it's going to take two people who both want it to happen. When I, um, I look at the story of Abraham and Isaac here, what an amazing trust this boy had in his father. Also, what an amazing boy, amazing trust this boy had in his father's trust of God. Isn't that something? I mean, to have enough, this boy had enough faith in his dad, enough trust in his dad to say, you know what, my dad will do the right thing here because I know he has great trust in God. That's an amazing story. Years ago, Brother Tom Vogel and I had taken some young people up to Michigan. We called a uh, leadership camp for a week. We had all kinds of different things that we, we did and, and uh, that would kind of build their, uh, their manhood a bit. And one of them was we, we taught the boys how to repel. And you take a rope, throw it over a cliff or a bridge, and you would put a harness on the young men, and, and uh, they would have a, a hook in front, and they would be snapped into a, a D-ring. And uh, they would then put this rope through this D-ring, and they would rappel down from either a cliff or a bridge, whatever we could find that was of, of a d decent height. Now, you think that doesn't sound so bad. It doesn't sound bad. Actually, it sounds pretty cool until you have to do it. When you have to do it, it's a whole new adventure. I remember we, we had, had a youth conference theme where it was about climbing a mountain. 
and uh, one of the videos that we did, all the youth conference speakers that uh, were speaking that, that year, we had, had them rappelling off the Jack Howells Memorial Auditorium off the, and down the wall. We took video of it, part of our intro to uh, the conference and, and uh, made it look like we were rappelling off the wall and then running in the auditorium and so forth. And, and so we showed the video of, of us rappelling. And I remember we had all these ropes and tied to a big steel beam up on top of the roof and then over the wall and we all had the harnesses on and we were, we were hooked up. And, but, and it was great until you had, it, you had to literally stand on the edge and lean back and let that rope hold you. And as I, you heard me preach on last week, I, I am very fearful of heights. And, uh, but I was in charge and so I had to make it look like I could do this. And I am, again, not looking down. I'm letting that rope, once that rope, you, your weight is over past the point of no return, and that rope is holding you, it's easy at that point. But getting from when you absolutely let yourself go and that rope holds you is a very, very difficult part. Because now you're relying upon the rope, you're relying upon the equipment, you're re relying upon whoever tied the knot on the other end, and a lot of different things, and so you're, you're, you're nervous about it, so you're leaning back. And I remember Brother Ray Young was next to me. And it wasn't saying anything, he was as quiet as he could be, but I could see him psyching himself up, and we, we did it. We released into that, into that rope, it tightened up and we rappel down. And once you start going down, it's fun. You can kind of let yourself glide down and you feel like a pro and it's great. And so the guys were filming us and they said, that was great. We're going to do it again though and get it from another angle. And so all of a sudden, I remember hearing Brother Ray Young go, And so we went back up the stairs up to the roof and, and we, we, we were hooking back up and I said, Brother Ray, and I knew he was pretty nervous and I said, we're only going to do this one more time. He said, that's right, Brother Eddie, only one more time. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> he had enough. But I remember when in... in uh, in Michigan, when we were taking the kids, we went over the Two Heart River and we tied off under the bridge. And, and we, on the boys, we would, we would uh, hook through the D-ring. And then we had on the back of each of their belts, we had, there was another ring back there. And we tied a rope onto that. And one man held that rope in case, for whatever reason, this rope would never break. But if it did, or came untied, or a D-ring broke, we would still have a second rope to hold on to so they wouldn't fall. And uh, so I remember uh, one, one young man, and uh, Joey, Joey Mitchell, I shouldn't have called his name, but since I did, Jack Mitchell's little brother. And I remember Joey Mitchell hanging on to the edge of the bridge. And you got you to gotta hook up, and you had to step over, and you had the Two Heart River right below you, probably about 60 feet, probably about the distance of this roof to the, to the floor down here. And so incredibly high, especially to a, a young boy, well, to me even. And, uh, but I remember it, you gotta, you got to let go of the bridge, and you got to hold on to the rope. And so to go from here to here was incredible. And so to let go of that, that thing, hold on, and you could do it with one hand, that was easy. But finally let go and just lean back, let your weight fall back and hold on that rope. It took some boys almost forever. But I remember Joey wasn't letting go. His hands were just gripped to that bridge. And Mr. Vogel, Jimmy Vogel, and myself, we were taking his fingers and we were prying them up. And we were, you got to do it, Joey, you got to do it. And I remember as he was getting to lean back, he said, I don't want to die. <laughs> you say, you were that kind of a youth director? Hey, it wasn't Abraham. I didn't put him on the altar. But when you let go and you, you find that rope is going to hold you, you're okay. And absolutely, the rappelling down is a, is a lot of fun. You see these guys coming out of helicopters and these commercials for the Army, and you see shows on television, they're rappelling, and they're, and they're going down. You think, that really looks pretty cool, but that first step is pretty tough. A youth conference with Brother Hiles years ago, uh, a Hiles Anner student, and uh, who had been in the military, and he was going to do some kind of Australian uh, uh, 
rappel, and where you just jump out and you free fall, and then you grab it right before you hit the ground. It's pretty cool. And he'd done it in the army and so forth. He says, I'm going to, when we come out, of, you know, for the skit, when we come out of the ceiling of the Jack Kyle's auditorium, he goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. And, and he did. But he didn't catch in time. And he went, zee! And he hit. I'm not lying. I remember the Hiles standing there, and I was standing there, and we went, oh! And the crowd, oh! And all of a sudden, this kid, he pops up. And he comes up, and he's one of the commandos, you know, and he's standing in front of Brother Hiles, and I'm right, right there where Brother Colston is, and, and in the Jack Hiles Auditorium, and he's standing there as one of the soldiers, and, and he had a little bit of blood coming down from a cut on his face, and Brother Hiles said, you're right. He said, I'm, I'm all right, I'm all right. And all of a sudden, he goes, <laughs> and passes out. He lived and uh, survived. The institution he's in today, no, he, uh, he's doing very, very well. But the fact is, when you make that first step, it's so uneasy. It's, again, it's like you know, you're looking over a cliff or letting go of your entire weight to hang on to that rope. And to, to let yourself go is a very interesting and very difficult place to be in life. There are a lot of feelings that go on. The young boy holding on to the bridge thought that the folks that were putting him over that bridge hated his guts and he was terrified. And, but it's those things, those times where you learn to develop the courage in your life. God has asked us to put our trust in several things, and I'm going to hustle through the points of the message here, but listen carefully. God, number one, wants us to put our trust in those that have the rule over us. It's an interesting statement here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. He says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and, they, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. In other words, us leaders, you, you know, God has asked us, asked you to put your faith and trust in us. And, 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 and we're being taught here that, yeah, pray for leadership because that we don't do distrust or put distrust in fellowship. But it is something that God has asked us, asked us to do. And one of the things that distrust or broken promises or broken trust deceives in us is I will never trust in that person or I will never trust in leadership or I will never trust in my spouse again. I will never trust in God again because broken promises were made to me. God gives us a command to trust in those leaders. You say, well, wait a minute, You're gonna, you, and, and I'll get to the verses in just a minute, that God teaches us not to put confidence in man. There is a measure of confidence that we ought to always have in God, for if man fails, God will never fail. Just as that boy was going off that bridge, he had a rope that he was working on. That rope was going to hold him, but he also had another rope that was tied to a loop in his back and a belt uh, that was tied around the back of him that other men, three men on top of that bridge were holding on. And when man fails, God won't, but God has used mankind to lead us and to guide us. And God has told us to put our faith and trust in them and submit to them. Say, I don't want to put my faith and trust in you disobeying God. Again, you look back at what distrust causes. It causes dissension. It causes divisions. It causes hurt feelings. It causes broken lives and broken relationships that will harm for, for years to come until you learn to relive that faith. First Peter, Peter tells the elders which are among you, I exhort who also am an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, talking about preachers. Neither, be, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but be exam, examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Hey, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the, to the humble. 
You know, God expects you to follow the leaders that God has given you. You say, well, I've lost my faith and trust, and, and it's just, I don't believe that anymore. I'm only trusting God, and I'm not trusting the leadership that's in front of me. I'm not trusting a new pastor that's coming into this church. I'm not trusting my Sunday school leaders. You listen to me carefully. Try, let your kids try that at home with you. Let them say, well, I'm going to tell you something, Dad. God told me not to put confidence in you. I can't imagine saying that to my father. I'd have been eaten through a straw for the next six weeks. No, God had placed my father in our home to lead and to guide us, when, especially at times I didn't understand, and I put my faith and confidence in my dad. Did my dad ever make mistakes? I would imagine he did. Did he ever fail? I would imagine he did. But my confidence was in him, and my trust was in him to his dying day. God also expects us to put our trust in his word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.21, for the prophecy came not in, time, in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of, old, of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, my, but my word shall not pass away. Hey, this book you got right here, it's pretty good once in a while to read it and trust it. Every word in this book is true. This is God's word. Every word is inspired by God. God wants us to look at this book and to study it and to have confidence in it. Well, I don't know if this verse is exactly right. I don't know if I ought to obey it. Hey, you obey every single word in this book. You obey every verse in this book. You obey, you obey every chapter in this book. You obey the books that are made up of the 66 books that create the King James Bible. I'm telling you right now, this is God's word. God inspired it and God had preserved it and God had made it for us today. And you wonder, well, I don't know if it's all true. It's all true. You can trust it. Well, I ought to find what parts I don't like and, and, and parts I do like and just take some and leave some. No, you ought to take it all. The reason you've not found order in your life is because you've not put your trust in God's Word, something that is very secure. You have a great distrust in your life for everything because maybe you were abused as a child. And I'm not discounting that. And I'm not putting that down. That is an awful thing to happen to somebody. But when it makes you want to distrust all authority and God's word, I'm going to tell you something. It will destroy your life. Put your trust in God's word. And number three, put your trust. God wants us to put our trust in him. In God, in God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Proverbs 3, 5. All thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. 1 Timothy chapter 6, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Psalms 118, 8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. In 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing... The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory of Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God wants us to put our faith and trust in him. God wants us to never realize for a second or never imagine for a second, I would say. Ma never imagine that God could ever fail you. Never imagine that God's rope will break. Never imagine that God's D-ring is going to fail. Never imagine that the men up top who tied the knot or had, didn't tie a good knot, knot. Never imagine that God will ever turn his back on you. Never imagine that God will fail you. God may allow you to go through circumstances and God may allow you go to go through heartaches and God may allow you to go through some bad times, but it's not because God failed you. 
God wants us to put our faith and trust in Him. Some of you have trust issues. Some of us have trust issues. I've been begging God for His guidance, and it seems like in the last two weeks, God has been telling me, Lapina, just shut up and trust me. Just trust me. God, God seems to be telling me every single day that, you know what, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. And I've been telling God the last three days, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I don't understand you, but I trust you. God, I don't understand what you're doing or where you're going, but I trust you. God, I trust your book right here. God, I trust your leaders. God, I trust you have, you are a sovereign God. You know the step that I take, and I have confidence in you. I have confidence in the men you put over us. I have confidence in the leaders you've given us. I have confidence in your church. I have confidence in your book. I have confidence in the things that you have said to me and the promises that you have given me. Where's your trust today? Where's your trust? Are you looking at the world right now through eyes and you're just coming to church because it's the thing to do and you don't know where to go and what to do? I can understand that. I really do. I can understand going through the difficult times and not understanding what life is all about. I can understand that today. But when you look at God in the face and say, God, look, at, I don't get you. I don't understand you. I don't like sometimes what you do. But maybe one day, whether you tell me or not, and I'll understand even through all of this, I still trust you. As Isaac was laying on that bed of wood, he saw the fire down below, realizing that in just a minute, his chest was going to be split open with this knife. And that his body was going to be burned as a sacrifice to the Lord. He trusted in his father. A man. A man. And trusted that his father had a good relationship and a great relationship with his heavenly father. What kind of an example are you being, dad? Hey, Sunday school teacher, what kind of example are you being? Where's your trust? Hey, school teacher, Hammond Baptist teacher, college professor, what's your example like? Are your students looking at you and trusting in you because they believe that you trust in the Lord and they have confidence in your relationship with God? It's very important for us, folks, to not lose sight of what's real and what's truth. This book right here will never fail you. God will never fail you. God will never hurt you on purpose. The hurt and pain... For the Jerry that you're going through today, God ordained. You men in wheelchairs today, the pain that you go through is God ordained. I don't like it. I don't like it. But just like you have to trust in the Lord, even the pain we go through here in different ways, we have to trust God too. Let me close with just a word here. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us in whom we trust that he yet, that he yet will yet deliver us. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. What is he saying here? He's saying, you got to look in yourself today. You've got to ask yourself if you've ever trusted and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And that final trust there, that trust that is the most important trust, is in trust in your eternal life. But we had the sentence of death in verse 9 said, in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. If we have never put our faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, we will suffer eternal damnation into hell forever and ever. There are many people who are living their days through life, living life as a humanist and trying to get through life all by themselves and making things happen all by themselves, thinking that you're going to be able to make eternity happen all by yourself. You're going to be leading off that bridge without a rope. You're thinking something's holding you and you're going to fall 
headlong into hell. And God says, no, 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 don't be a reprobate. In other words, don't turn away and misconstrue the things of God. God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you that you should trust him. Trust in him and put your faith in him. That faith that you have in your heart, make it an action by trust saying, Jesus Christ, I accept you as my savior. It's one way to think that rope will hold me. It's another thing to trust it and to lean back on it. It's one thing to know what Scripture says and to have faith that the Word of God is true. It's another thing to trust in it. So the Hassey married a young couple on this platform yesterday. They had faith that they both would walk the aisle. They had faith that they both would want to live with each other forever. They had faith that they would both say the vows. But when they came up here, they actually trusted in each other enough to make those vows. That's what you need to do today. If you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, today is the day you need to make that happen. You need to trust Him. You need to accept Him.